So hello everyone once again. Today, today is our last day and our last lecture at the Ocean Lecture Hall within the series of events dedicated to ocean and climate science. And please welcome our dearest guest, Dr. Ricardo Raura, who is an Antarctic con conservation professional and independent scholar with extensive experience in research, analysis and advocacy in Antarctica and the Antarctic Treaty System. So please, Dr. Raura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Gabradin. Let me just share my screen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will present today the conclusions of a workshop on Antarctic climate change that took place in March 2021, which was organized by a think tank in Washington DC in the United States called um, the Walter Wilson International Center for Scholars. At this workshop, about 20 international scientists of significant uh, experience discussed uh, the Southern Ocean and its impact from the impact it receives from climate change and also the, um, the impact it has in global climate re regulation, marine ecosystems and on human, human communities across the world. And also the policy answers required to address this crisis. I will approach this issue with uh, some humility uh, since I'm not one of the producers of the science uh, underlying the report, unlike most of my other co-authors and workshop participants. At the same time, I have worked for many years as an observer, analyst and researcher in Antarctica and in the Antarctic Treaty System, which is the international regime derived from the Antarctic Treaty on 1959 that governs the Antarctic region. As a result, I have an insight on how um, Antarctic diplomatic fora deal with climate change challenges and will offer some of those insights to you. Here I will present my own views rather than the other report authors, the workshop participants or ASOC. And of course, any error or interpretation is mine. I would like to thank also uh, all the various authors, particularly Andrea Capurro, the lead author, uh, Florence Colioni, Rachel Downey, Evgeny Pachomov, well, that's me, uh, Anne Christensen, the contributors from the Wilton Center, Evan Bloom and Mikhail Stith, and also especially my uh, ASOC colleagues in Russia, Elena uh, Sarkova and Masha Boronsova, who helped me to, to prepare. And finally, thank all, uh, the, the Ocean Lecture Hall for, for inviting me to give this lecture to you. My begin with one question, and is why should be uh, Russian audiences interested in the Southern Ocean surrounding Antarctica? And for that, I think there are two uh, important reasons or two, two important answers. The first one is history. 200 years ago, the first Russian Antarctic expedition on the sloops Vostok and Mirny, led for Fabian Bellingshausen and Mikhail Lazarev, circumnavigated Antarctica. And on 16th January 1820, they were the first to sight the Antarctic continent. The expedition was the beginning of a Russian engagement in Antarctica including in the Southern Ocean surrounding it, this area here, this is the Southern Ocean, Antarctica. Um, and that, that engagement continues until today. The second reason is climate, or rather climate change. 200 years after the first Russian Antarctic expedition, anthropogenic climate change is pushing the Antarctic towards numerous 
tipping points that will impact on wider Earth systems with significant implications for humanity and biodiversity. And now, climate change impacts in Antarctica will resonate in Russia and in every corner of the world. The main points I will make uh, in this presentation, and apologies if my Russian translation is not quite correct, is that global climate change is causing a disproportionate impact in the Southern Ocean surrounding Antarctica. Climate change impacts have global consequences and climate action is required from nations and international bodies. And we need to work harder to address climate change. I briefly describe the, the methodology of the workshop uh, in which our report was based. And for that, we identified first uh, Antarctic scientists that have been involved in significant climate change research in the context of the UNF uh, C, IPCC, and Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research Programs, or that have published um, high impact papers on climate change, as well as people who were involved in scientific discussions in the context of the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, also called as, known as CAMELAR, which is one of the international bodies that govern the Antarctic region, specifically the Southern Ocean. 20 people agreed to participate, and we uh, first invited them to discuss according to their own disciplines, which were mostly uh, climate, ice and ocean and marine science, as well as um, camelar issues. A question addressing what could camelar do in, I'm sorry, what could Camelar do in, in the next decade or so to address uh, climate, to contribute to, to regional and global climate resilience? So to, to improve conditions with respect to climate change. We then divided them in three mixed groups in which they could exchange with more, um, in a more creative way in a way, to answer the question how the changes in the Southern Ocean affect global climate regulation and broader marine ecosystem resilience and the longer term impact in human communities. Finally, we had a, a third session, a plenary with all the participants, which brought various uh, comments to their own discussions. And that was the basis of our report. In brief, uh, what were the the outcomes of the discussion, how is climate change impacting on Antarctica? It happens that all global ocean bases converge in the Southern Ocean, which redistributes heat, salt, fresh water from melted ice and nutrients around the planet. In recent years, the Southern Ocean has been warming both superficially and to a greater depth than the global average. The workshop concluded that climate change is rapidly pushing five critical interconnected processes in the Southern Ocean towards substantial changes. And these include, or these are, uh, warming ocean temperatures, sorry, which lead to um, ice shelf collapse and glacial retreat, diminishing sea ice, An acidifying ocean and changes to the um, regional carbon sequestration, which we'll discuss briefly later, and then uh, changing ecosystems and species dynamics. And these changes apply to all scales in the, in the Antarctic food chain, from plankton and smaller cre creatures to the benthic fauna that uh, lives in the seabed to the higher predators like uh, marine mammals and birds and fish, which are not represented here. And I, a key issue is that these um, impacts are interacting cumulatively, cumulative and long-term. And some of them may last for longer than the, 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 the process that led to them, may, may last for a longer term. In, in the report, we 
spoke about the issue of tipping points, and I wanted to, to understand better or to deepen on this. And according to the IPCC, a tipping point is a level of change in system properties beyond which a system reorganizes, often in a nonlinear manner, and does not return to the initial state, even if the drivers of the change are abated. For the climate system, this, the term refers to a crit critical threshold at which global or regional climate changes from one sorry, global or regional climate changes from one stable state to another one. And here we see two examples. Uh, we have a stable state here. If the conditions change on the vertical axis, occurs a bifurcation resulting from a change in external variables. And what we get is a different um, stable state. The same applies here with a change of system, which the, which the change occurs on the um, horizontal axis. This may lead to a, a regime shift that could mean that the change is irreversible. On the left uh, is simply a graph showing that there is an association between the different uh, components of the ocean system. Uh, Dr. Vaura? Yes. Sorry for interruption. It seems that several of your slides wasn't changed. We still see the first screen with the title. For the title? Yes, we see the first title. Yes, the climate change oh. and carbon ocean resilience. Maybe you didn't switch some slides. Can you please it, it, check? Is, it is changing on my, um, on my screen. Now you see the... The, the, the title. Yes, yes. Then then you see the acknowledgments, maybe. I see it on my screen. It's a screen I'm sharing. Yes, and do you have, uh, it's the only slide you have, right? Or you have? I have many, okay. Now you oh, see. Oh, yes. It. Yes, now we see it. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank I you. do apologize. Uh, I do apologize. Because actually there were quite interesting slides. Um, Right, then I will go very quickly uh, because it's worth doing. And this is what I wanted to show you uh, before. I, I do apologize for having to do this, but this is the, the amazing um, expedition in which uh, the first Russian uh, Antarctic expedition was led by Bellingshausen circumnavigated the Antarctic 200 years ago. So that's why I was saying the first reason to care about the Antarctic from Russia is, sorry, is history. And the second one is climate, because with 200 years different, we see uh, significant changes in the Antarctic climate. And in this instance, in this picture, for instance, it shows um, a collapse a, a, of one of the ice shells in a collapse about 20 years ago in the eastern part of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, my, my points, this is a summary of our discussion, which you would have understood. And um, I am back now in uh, how climate change is imparting, impacting on the Antarctic. And here I was saying that um, temperature, increasing water temperature influences the loss of glacier, was floating um, or marine ice shells as well as land ice, affect the creation of sea ice, um, the absorption of CO2 influences the chemistry of the ocean, uh, the this carbon pump is disrupted, and then all marine life is affected in various ways. And then I was on the slide in which um, I was just before, which referred to um, tipping points in which we go from a uh, stable state through changes uh, in conditions or changes in the state itself, state of the system, it goes to a new stable system. And this change might be irreversible. And if you look on the left, it simply refers, or it's not simply, it's a complex process, but refers to how different the components of the ocean system are interconnected. So changes on one, for instance, on the physical uh, boundary conditions of the system through various physical drivers can um, cascade through the entire ocean. And again, perhaps result in tipping points and a complete regime shift with um, a change of um, a permanent change, irreversible change of the ocean. 
So that's what we are facing with climate change. In, in a recent report from 2019 uh, on the oceans and cryosphere, uh, there are a number of graphs which I'm going to show. Uh, this graph contrasted projected future changes based on, on model projections. There is a substantial difference on the increase of global mean surface air temperature. It's the three values here global surface in temperature, sea surface temperature, and marine heat waves, depending on which um, projections we use in models. So we are in the present here, uh, sorry, here. And uh, the, the blue uh, projection refers to the low carbon, um, low greenhouse gas emissions scenario with a high mitigation future, and the, which has also a reasonably high chance of uh, limiting global warming below two centigrades by uh, to the end of the century. Instead, a, a high greenhouse gas emissions scenario in the absence of policies to combat climate change leads to a continued and sustained growth in atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas concentrations. So it's a considerably worse scenario. And these three graphs, it is the context for the following graph, which addresses the, um, how various other processes impact on the, the ice system and on sea level rise. Uh, this shows a temperature at, in, at depth, up to 2000 meter depth, and then changes on um, the Greenland ice sheet mass, the Antarctic ice sheet mass, and the glacier glacier loss generally. Together with a, a warming of the ocean, the graph uh, on top, those are the primary drivers for a substantial increase of a uh, substantial different sea level rise. On this century, it would be almost half a degree, sorry, half a meter between one and the other. And in the, in the next 200 years after this century, would be the several meters of difference, depending on whether we follow the low carbon scenario or we follow the high carbon scenario. But of course, there are many uncertainties in these models and uncertainties also um, about the, the timing, the possible timing for this collapse. But the, the belief is, um, according to recent estimates, a sea level rise and coastal flooding this century could be up to threefold greater than previously anticipated, threatening 1 billion people living below 10 meters uh, of altitude of the sea level, and then uh, including two 230 million people be living below 1 meter of uh, altitude above the sea level. And that includes me, I live in, in the Netherlands, uh, actually below sea level at the moment. This graph shows two different mechanisms of instability of ice shells in, as the ocean heats. And I think uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll be brief, but it simply shows that there are different mechanisms, mechanisms that are led by ocean warming, both result in a thinning of ice and um, a retreat of the grounding line that holds the glaciers. So as the ocean warms, the, 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 Asian, the glaciers, I'm sorry, the ice shells, excuse me, collapse in according to various processes and lead to a potentially constant, you know, in unstoppable degree of the ice shells. Uh, Sea ice, uh, this is a, a seasonal sea ice surrounding the Antarctic region. Climate change has a discernible influence on the Arctic where you are, but uh, it has a, a more complicated and messy influence on Antarctic sea ice. The last few years, however, have shown a strong increase in annual mean sea ice cover, largely driven by warmer atmospheric circulation. 
and warmer water close to the ice edge. The third uh, process we mentioned was a change in ocean chemistry. And this is results from the um, dissolution of uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 in the water, which leads to the creation of carbonic acid, uh, which in turn dissociates and creates uh, acid uh, ions that react with, um, with uh, organisms that have um, uh, uh, argonite cells or cells that were made from, from a carbon net. And the projections are again in, in, the, in the scales to an in, a lowering in pH, meaning an increase in acidity of, uh, in the surface ocean pH, as well as a decrease in um, the oxygen concentration of the ocean. And those processes, if they occur, could be, or when they occur, they could have a, an impact on uh, Antarctic um, marine fauna like this two here, a sea butterfly, Limacine Antarctica or the Antarctic krill. And that could be quite significant uh, to the extent that Antarctic krill is really at the base of the, the Antarctic food chain. So the impacts on krill could replicate or uh, resonate rather in um, through all the, the food, Antarctic food chain. And these are models that suggest that with the low carbon emission, there would be some changes but in some areas, primarily again on of East Russia, uh, however, potentially much significant uh, ocean changes in, in, in the whole of the higher latitudes with uh, conditions that are um, corrosive uh, for, for different uh, carbonates. We mentioned before the carbon pump, uh, Southern Ocean continental shells are seasonally highly productive in phytoplankton through carbon capture and fixation by phytoplankton. And some of this carbon sinks later to the seabed where it's, and is buried. Some is stored in the bodies of animals and some is recycled by bacteria. Ocean warming, however, could reduce the efficiency of this process and uh, by promoting a shallower mineralization of um, atmospheric carbon and decreasing the overall the carbon storage and the availability of food to mid water and seafloor communities. So this process would be another one that would be uh, potentially impacted by, um, by climate change. To conclude this issue of um, shifting ecosystems and species dynamics is a representation of the food change. They would be affected uh, in particular uh, in terms of their geographic distribution, for instance, and uh, food availability. For example, climate change may have already led krill, which plays a key role in Antarctic food waves to migrate southward, so to highest latitude, cooler water, and then again uh, it moves away from, from its predators. And changes in fish and creek populations will impact on other species such as penguins, seabirds, seals, and whales, which play an important role in connecting marine food waves in the Southern Ocean. And the cumulative consequences of uh, such effects are largely unknown. We can skip this graph, but in essence, first it shows, yes, it shows the, the impacts of um, physical changes on top predators. And the, the red is, is, is impact that is negative. So it's predicted to be negative for mo most of the species in most conditions resulting from, from ocean drivers and also from temperature and, and sea ice, but I included also because it shows more local drivers that will also potentially in, affect these species. So the fact is, of course, we are looking at climate changes, but also there are locally driving changes that influence um, 
life and uh, require also to be addressed by policy. Antarctica has a role in climate regulation. Climate impacts in the Southern Ocean result from far reaching, has potentially far reaching global impacts. Ocean circulation around the globe is linked to heat and carbon storage and, and nutrient cycling. But what I really like about this graph is a projection, a steel house projection that shows the, the, the central role the ocean has in, in the globally. It has also, also shows how Antarctica is, is central to this process. And Okay, uh, this leads us to the second part, which is how changes in the Southern Ocean will impact global systems. And we mentioned several of them, uh, such as global sea level rise, changes in sea surface temperatures, loss of critical habitat and biodiversity, altered weather patterns, etc. Um, all these changes would require some sort of climate action by policymakers. And as an example, uh, this is a selection of extreme events in the past 20 years or so, since 1998, uh, which with links to oceans and cryosphere. And we would see that these climate events occur in, in, in various parts of the world, uh, including cyclones, extreme rainfall, drought, uh, marine heat waves, and others, and also have been incidents, instances of uh, sea ice minimums, both in the Antarctic, in, in the Weddell Sea, but also in, in the Arctic. And you will be, of course, very familiar with uh, issues concerning climate change in, in the Arctic region. This is another projection showing uh, candidates for high probability, high impact marine tipping events that concern warming, deoxygenation, and ocean acidification as well as their impact. And with respect to, to the Antarctic region, uh, we see potentially large scale ocean circulation changes uh, as well as um, northern Atlantic and into the uh, sea for, for Russia, for, for instance, a number of other potential issues of concern such as coastal acidification and deoxygenation and of course, Arctic sea ice reduction. So we'll take a break now from the, the more science-based commentary and we will look into um, the policy side of things. And this is a very oversimplified version of the Antarctic Treaty system, which is the, the, the system uh, derived from the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. And key for the governance of the Southern Ocean is a, a treaty agreed in 1980, the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, and its um, governing body, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, as well as the Scientific Committee, etc. And this uh, commission is a body that takes uh, measures, uh, agrees on measures that can potentially help to address climate change from the perspective of the governance of the Antarctic region. And then there is a later agreement in 1990, uh, which is a protocol on environmental protection to the Antarctic Treaty. It both applies to somewhat different areas. Uh, the area of interest for us is the area in yellow, which covers most of the Southern Ocean. And uh, that's the area where the Camelar Convention applies. Camelar, the commission, which I mentioned before, has been discussing um, climate change for since 2005. A recent study looked into the history of Camelar with respect to climate change. 
and uh, it shows here that camera has included climate change in, and its effects on Southern Ocean ecosystems in its discussions. It has adopted several measures relevant to climate change, which are in bold here. The one is a resolution on climate change, which is a non-binding instrument. Then two, uh, the adoption of protected areas, and um, also the adoption of the time limited uh, protection for areas where ice fields have collapsed. And finally, also very importantly, uh, adopted a, a marine protected area in the Rossi region in 1995. But equally, uh, it has not agreed on some actions that have been put on the table and has had a, a limited incorporation of climate change in uh, binding decisions. And this is an issue that uh, requires more dialogue and, and, and discussion among parties. This includes, for instance, the issue of uh, marine protected areas in the Antarctic. Uh, as I mentioned, the Ross CMPA was adopted in 2016. There was an early, uh, this is here, there was an early marine protected area proposal for the South Arkney Islands, it was adopted in 2009. And then there are three other proposals on the table, uh, which have been discussed for, for ten, some time and are uh, still on the agenda. I looked at this, uh, the evolution of camera discussions under the, the policy cycle, uh, that is, it was from agenda setting to the formulation of policy, the adoption of policy, its implementation, evaluation, and eventually uh, the continuation or discontinuation. And my sense is that uh, Camelar has firmly climate change on the agenda. Uh, it has formulated some, or discussed at least some policy. Um, it has adopted some measures which are important, although in some cases temporary to address climate change. For instance, uh, the, the protection afforded to areas where an ice shelf has collapsed is temporary and may expire after 10 years. And, so there are some, some details and it has implemented, of course, all these things, but then uh, as a whole, uh, still needs to complete the circle on a more systematic way, in, in a way, in a more focused way. Uh, one of the issues that has not been discussed yet is the adoption of a climate change response work plan, which is on the table. Uh, of course, policy discussions can be complex and messy and take time, but eventually uh, the idea is that Camelar will be able to, to address this issue in, in all the measure it takes and through the whole of the, the policy cycle. In the workshop, we discussed um, how to build resilience to climate change in the Southern Ocean from the Antarctic and uh, the key actions identified include reducing greenhouse emissions, establishing the proposed Southern Ocean MPAs to protect biodiversity uh, and, and meet some other functions, update regional management strategies and incorporate climate change in, in policy and, and management instruments to strengthen ecosystem-based management sorry, ecosystem-based fisheries management policies, which is one of the functions of, of the Camelar. And also re-emphasizing the use of a precautionary approach to decision-making in the Southern Ocean. These two principles, the ecosystem-based approach and uh, the precautionary principle are already built into the convention and uh, aim to prevent irre irreversible changes. Uh, the idea is, however, to um, use them more intentionally or prosperously. There is also um, a range of global frameworks addressing climate change. And uh, the 
the key one, one is the United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change, which provides the, the structure for nations to limit further emissions through their nationally determined contributions. There is um, United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development between now and the um, 2030. And this uh, aims to provide the ocean science to support the, the decision making on sustainable management and achieve also the, the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. Its remit includes uh, mapping and protecting ecosystems as well as the creation of MPAs, although there are many other um, objectives as well. Uh, and there is also a parallel process uh, for the high seas to, um, to agree on a, on a new international agreement for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The EU Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And of course, Antarctic treaty system bodies can contribute to this work from the Antarctic region, so can contribute to, to a global effort. I should mention one, one other aspect, which is that uh, the Antarctic treaty system states, including Russia and others, but primarily um, the European Union, the United States, the UK, Russia, China, are among the top producers of CO2. So and as such, they have a certain um, obligation to, to take action on the Southern Ocean, which covers about 10% of the ocean and which they manage in a way on behalf of the, the international community. So that's uh, an important step. Uh, particularly, as I mentioned before, global climate change is causing a disproportionate impact on the Southern Ocean that will have global consequences and it requires climate action from nation and international bodies. We all need work to work harder to, to address climate change. And on a, I would also like to mention that international scientific cooperation is built in the Antarctic Treaty System. It's an essential part of it. Uh, and it's a way in which countries um, can work together beyond their difficulties in, in other areas. Uh, and I think this is um, this gives us hope that through international cooperation, Antarctic Treaty bodies, particularly Camelar, can take action to, to address climate change in, in the Southern Ocean. I think this is not a complete overview of climate change in the Southern Ocean. I apologize for the issue with slides at the beginning. But I hope I have underscored some important issues that require further consideration and action by decision makers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raura. Uh, no worries about the slides. Uh, the video is recorded, so any one of the participants will have a chance to see the slides or to make a post on the slide they are interested in. Uh, we have two questions so far. The first question is about species in Antarctica. Uh, you were showing connections between so many species, how they interconnect in their life cycle. Uh, but what animal species are most vulnerable today in Antarctica, which we must pay our crucial attention to? Because you know, people always show in penguins, maybe some whales, but you were talking about creels and there are so many small creatures. Yes, I and mean, it's a good question. Um, my sense, I'm not a biologist, but my sense is climate, climate change is very, um, it doesn't affect all the ecosystem everywhere at once. It affects different species or different um, variables differently in, in, in many different places and also in the Antarctic. So in the Antarctic, some species are more vulnerable than others, maybe in certain places. And as I mentioned before, krill apparently, or according to, to recent studies, is migrating south from its usual area where it normally lives or where it, it 
concentrates. So its habitat, in a way, is reducing. And it, it, that's because of changes to primarily, as I understand, to, to water temperature uh, and to a degree, maybe, ocean acidification. And then, for instance, if you take the, um, the iconic species of the Antarctic, like penguins, different species uh, react to climate change differently. And at the moment, there are some winners and losers. losers. The species that are uh, ice dependent are under more pressure than other species, particularly the emperor penguin, which breeds on sea ice. Uh, earlier this year, at another set of uh, meetings of the Antarctic Treaty system, there was a proposal to um, declare the emperor penguin as a specially protected species, because it is predicted that it will suffer quite considerable, considerably in, in, in decades to come. And also other species of penguin uh, in the peninsula Antarctica, for instance, they, uh, they also react differently with the uh, Gantu penguins are doing quite well. Uh, Adelie penguins and uh, Chinstrand penguins are, are doing less well and are moving somewhere else. And two factors to consider, and one is that uh, first climate change impacts um, are very long term, even if we take action today, maybe they will, it will not change things in, in some regards. It doesn't mean we shouldn't take action. And secondly, there are, as I mentioned in one of my slides, there are also pressures which are more local or more regional. And one of them is fishing. So fishing is also uh, impacting locally on, on species that live in that area. Because those species, you know, the Antarctic marine ecosystem is primarily, sorry, the Antarctic ecosystem is primarily a marine ecosystem. So species live on land, but uh, feed at sea. So it is a very, very complex uh, process. And this is all I can say for the time being on that question. But thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. I think it's very important for our guests to be more included into the topic. Uh, there is a question from Maria. I suppose she's a student from St. Petersburg. Uh, so her question is a little bit tricky. Who are those people who decide on Atlantic Treaty? How are they chosen to decide what should be included into the treaty? What articles? So if you just tell us briefly who those yes. people are. Who those people are? It's a very good question too. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty was signed in, as I said, in 1958, sorry, 59. And it was negotiated uh, in the previous years. And it was signed by uh, the 12 countries at the time that were very active in the Antarctic. Is what they are called the original signatories. And that includes, um, well, at the time of the Soviet Union, but now it's Russia doing that work, but includes also, um, you know, several of the powers of the world. Uh, you find that on, easily on, on the internet, it's the United States, UK, France, uh, as well as some developing countries like Argentina, Chile, South Africa are also members of the treaty. Now they, they, they got together and the people who represented those countries, the individuals behind the, those discussions were selected by the countries. It's generally the, the people involved with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of each country. When you go to Camelar, so the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, uh, which is very related to the Antarctic Treaty itself, then people there are from maybe foreign affairs, but also uh, from fisheries agencies, from um, environmental agencies, science uh, institutions, and so on. So um, it is very varied, but in essence, uh, it's not just one individual sitting there, it's, it's a state policy for countries that are active in, in, in a target treaty system. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is one last question, I think. Uh, it's, this question is from me directly because our audience is young people mm -hmm. and I'm sure more many of them in future will be political leaders, maybe in 20 or 15 years. What words would you address to future generations of leaders right now? 
how can they advocate or contribute to Antarctica protection in future? What would you tell them? Well, thank you. That's a very good question, Irina. I think uh, people need to ask, um, you know, various countries cover the Antarctic region uh, and they are leaders in that area. I think at the national level, uh, we also can expect from our leaders to, to take action on this issue. And that thinking that, uh, of course, uh, we are not thinking of us necessarily, but of future generations and how they will deal with uh, the, the problems we created and generations before we did. So um, I'd say, there are many ways of doing that, you know, in politics, uh, but also in the context of the Antarctic, there is science is a, is a very strong currency, something very valuable. So if people have inclination, they can also um, study science and try to get involved in Antarctic research. And of course, in Russia, you have the advantage. Uh, it is one of the few na nations that has really bipolar. So you work in both polar regions in terms of uh, science and other activities. And so you have an opportunity to, to develop um, experience on, on the, in the polar regions in a way without leaving your, your own country. And then you can you know, use that experience in, in other ways. That would be one, one comment. Um, I can also actually mention uh, my colleagues in, in Russia, uh, they are very involved on issues of outreach and education. And that is something that comes very often in, in Antarctic uh, treaty discussions. And there are some initiatives uh, to do that, or to, to be involved in, in that kind of thing. And uh, I know they have done really interesting work to show images of the Antarctic and ideas and concepts to not just perhaps university students or, or the common public, but also for very young uh, children of Russia. So I think that's also a very valuable initiative and worth looking into it. So I say education, get involved. Uh, yeah, do your best to feel work if you can. So thank you, thank you very much. So on our side, we did our best to present these lectures within the Ocean Lecture Hall and we have some more events coming. So with our audience and I would like to thank you, Dr. Raura, for joining us today, for sharing this very thoughtful and very inspiring presentation, answering other questions. We hope to welcome you to our future lectures and events and uh, to see you once again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So this was the end of our third day of the Ocean Lecture Hall. We would like to thank all our dearest guests and our partners, the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, Lomonosov State University and Marine Research Center of the Lomonosov State University, as well as Komsomolska Pravda, who is our information support partner. Uh, all the lectures are recorded and available on Kamsamolska Pravda platform, as well as on the official website of our project, www.univer.isdsu. Uh, we would like also to invite you for an online lesson, which is held tomorrow. Uh, the lesson called Two Polar Oceans, and it is held uh, by our dearest friend and brilliant teacher, Yelena Zharkova. So please join us for tomorrow lesson and don't forget to follow up the Q&A boxes under the video because we have more questions coming and we have more answers from our lectures. Thank you very much and see you soon.